Bad news, Justice League, your movie tanked. Now I have no choice but to call the one superhero who's still capable of saving the DC universe. What are you talking about? The only superhero who isn't here is- Yes! Oh no. Go for Aquaman! Aw oh, man, knew I should have sprung for that case. Internet, welcome to Film Theory, the show that has the ability to communicate with fish. Good fish. Very good fish. Loyal theorists, back in 2018, millions of people flooded the theaters and swam through packed lobbies to watch a really cool guy named Arthur Curry become, well, an even cooler guy responsible for saving both land and sea. Atlantis has always had a king. Now I need something more. A hero. A king fights only for his nation, you. Fight for everyone. The James Wan-directed Aquaman was a global smash hit that pulled in $1.1 billion worldwide while writing the DC Extended Universe ship after Justice League sunk at the box office. So how did James Wan manage to pull it off? By giving DC fans a downright bonkers movie where it feels like the producers just said yes to every single idea that Wan had. Indiana Jones side plot? Yes. An Annabelle the Evil doll cameo? Yes. Explosions to end every single scene? Yes. Ripping through the ocean floor on a giant leviathan to decimate a shark army with lasers on their head? Shell yes. I have one simple request, and that is to have sharks with frickin' laser beams attached to their heads. Never mind pesky details like, you know, consistency of Aquaman's powers. As long as you've got yourself an octopus playing drums, I am all about it. Now, throughout the film, Arthur, the half-human son of the Queen of Atlantis, is reminded many times, probably too many times, in fact, that he is the one true heir to the Atlantean throne and will one day unite the worlds of land and sea. The throne is yours by birthright. The only way to stop this war and save both worlds is for you to take your rightful place as king. But are you really sure about that one, Mira? Because by the end of the movie, Arthur, the man who will bridge the gap between land and sea, doesn't deliver on any of that stuff. Oh sure, he does take the rightful throne. I give you King Arthur of Atlantis. Hail to the king! Uh -huh. What do I do now? But Arthur is nobody's hero in this movie. If you actually look at his actions throughout the film, Arthur devastates both land and sea with wanton abandon. Or should I say wanton abandon. I hate myself, I am so sorry. He's originally brought into the fight under this premise. Your half-brother, King Orm, is about to declare war upon the surface world. Billions will die. But in rising to the throne, Arthur creates just as, if not more, destruction than his brother. Theorists, this is not your parents' Aquaman. And no, I'm not just talking about the fact that he got, like, outrageously sexy. As you're about to see, our historically pro-fish protagonists send scores of endangered sea creatures to their deaths. And not only is the dude PETA's worst nightmare, he doesn't really give a flying fish about the lives of the land dwellers either. I mean, you probably already suspected that Aquaman kinda sucked, but did you think the reason would be for his superhuman lack of empathy? Hold your breath and plug Plug your nose, dear theorists, because today we're throwing some cold water on Jason Momoa's cold-hearted Aquaman. Oh, dang it, the water just made him even sexier, didn't it? So, the scene in Aquaman that really got my theorist juices flowing is this climactic battle at the Brine, a lava-heavy area of the ocean populated by large crabs who seemingly just want to be left alone so they can build their lava catapults. Honestly, hashtag relatable. Throughout the movie, we've seen, step by step, the evil Orm slowly taking over the various underwater kingdoms in his quest to become the Ocean Master. The last kingdom standing in his way is the Brine. The stakes are high. If he's able to win this battle, he'll command the greatest army on the planet, and in so doing, will be able to wipe out every land dweller with ease. Prepare your armies, your highness. We move against the Brine Kingdom at once. Admittedly, it's a bit weird that Orm needs so many armies to help him out, considering earlier in the film he's able to summon waves that cause trillions of dollars of damage to the eastern seaboard and straight up washes warships onto the shore. But hey, let's not get bogged down in the plot. James Wan certainly didn't. This was Orm's doing. The 
worst is yet to come. Anyway, just as Orm's about to claim victory by killing the Brine King, a gigantic eruption comes from the ocean floor as the Karenthin, uh, sorry, the Karethin, an ancient beast measuring 3.2 kilometers, that's two miles for us Imperial System land dwellers, bursts up and under the control of Aquaman himself, promptly destroys the ever-living daylight out of everything in sight. Soldiers from both armies, sea creatures carrying soldiers on their backs, small ships, medium ships, large ships. If it exists, Aquaman is here to destroy it. No questions asked. And see, this is where Aquaman's behavior starts to get a little squicky. I mean, the first major round of casualties are the crab people of the brine. Remember, these were the last holdouts against King Orm. You will never have my allegiance! So be it! And yet, this primarily ground-based army are the first casualties of Aquaman as the Karethin rips through the ocean floor to launch an attack. In this one dramatic entrance, Aquaman destroys thousands of their troops and a huge chunk of the Brine homeland. I mean, that just kind of sucks. Now, that alone wouldn't be all that big of a deal. Sure, Aquaman doesn't properly contain his new pet, a beast that would make Godzilla pee in his pants, but you see, that's not all. Aquaman possesses the trident of of Atlan, a staff that gives him the ability to communicate to all sea life. Well, kind of. Unlike your old school Aquaman from 1941 who could just talk to fish, Arthur seems to be taking a page out of 2011's Aquaman, where his ability is to reach into the midbrains of sea creatures and control them telepathically, sometimes against their will. And if you need proof of this, look no further than the animation. He takes hold of the trident and is immediately connected to everyone's neurological system. So what does Aquaman King of Atlantis, hero of the sea, do with this newfound power? He summons thousands of unarmed whales, dolphins, fish, and manta rays to join the fight. Sure, it's an impressive visual, but he's sending unarmored animals charging headfirst into an army of deadly laser-shooting armored foes. And what's more, a ton of these animals, who again, are actively being compelled to fight via Aquaman's 100% consent-free brain hack trick, are on the endangered species list. Here's a quick run down are the ones I was able to pick out amid the visual chaos. Great Hammerhead Shark, Endangered, Narwhal, Near Threatened, Blue Whales, Endangered, Various Dolphin Species, some of which are Endangered, Killer Whales, Endangered, Fin Whales, Endangered, Great White Sharks, Vulnerable. I know that there's a lot of chaos on screen, but try watching it frame by frame and you suddenly see that there's even sharks attacking other sharks. Why is Aquaman allowing this? It seems like he never considered his actions, and the end result is just the death of endangered animals and animal-on-animal -animal violence. All win, it's worth noting, he could have just sent all the animals away and won the battle using the Karathin, who very clearly was just unaffected by any and all attempts to attack it. To rub salt water into the Atlantean's wounds, Aquaman even summons thousands of trench monsters, who literally tear apart anyone and anything in their path. Notably, warriors who were only forced into the battle after Orm killed their leader. And does Aquaman care? No, because because clearly he doesn't care about the lives of innocent people and animals in the slightest. And if you think I'm exaggerating, during the melee, instead of stopping the carnage, he opts to enjoy a nice long kiss with Mira. In a scene that outright starts with her saying this. There are too many casualties. We have to stop the fighting now. We need to stop the fighting now. Or at least after a 25 second makeout sesh and an erect trident gag. And to cap it all off, he hops on a sea dragon and rides it directly into the mouth of Orm's Tylosaur. Once again, makes for a very cool visual, but he takes a beautiful sea creature, innocent, and sacrifices it for no reason. Like, was he hoping that the Tylosaur would choke on the sea dragon? You know it's not a good look when Orm, a guy who wants to kill every land dweller, cares enough about his sea creature army to deck him out with armor, while our hero sends armorless endangered whales to collide with enemy ships. All throughout this battle, Arthur shows absolutely zero concern for the people and creatures of the sea. He tears through the brine, his allies in the battle, he shows no mercy to the warriors forced to march alongside Orm, and he hacks into the midbrains of endangered sea creatures to force them to fight on his behalf against a vicious armored battalion. You can even see the sharks struggling to resist against his control, so okay, that pretty much covers Aquaman's complete and utter disdain for sea life, but that's nothing compared to his disdain for the land dwellers. Let's go back to that moment that Aquaman bursts up through the ocean floor riding the Karathin. Now, 
I understand that he needed to rush into battle. And while his entrance certainly makes waves, it, uh, well, it, it makes waves. Literal, literal waves. Forget the fact that Aquaman's bursting up out of the sea floor stunt instantly kills countless crab soldiers defending the brine. Look at how much of the sea floor is getting displaced. Now, the Carathon is huge, around two miles long, or about 3.2 kilometers, and ripping a massive two-mile hole through the crust of the ocean floor is gonna cause some massive complications. I mean, think about it. The Carathon, who resides in Earth's core, which is presumably located in Earth's actual core, just burrowed up through approximately 2,900 kilometers of Earth. That's about 1,800 miles for all you imperialists out there. And the water that was just sitting calmly in the ocean suddenly is massively shifting to fill that hole. This is gonna result in some huge redistribution of sediment, displacing the water column in an unbelievable fashion. Plus, it's a disruption to the brine, which is already a tectonically active region. That, my friends, is a recipe for a tsunami. A tsunami that's likely gonna cost thousands of innocent land dwellers their lives. Now, normally tsunamis, giant destructive water waves, originate from displacement in oceans caused by earthquakes, massive landslides, or explosions. So I can't say with 100% certainty what would happen when a gigantic two-mile-long kaiju explodes through the ocean floor after traveling from a hidden world. But watch just how much of the seafloor is displaced when the Carathon explodes from the Earth. And this isn't just a small shifting of tectonic plates, this is multiple miles of ocean floor exploding. For comparison, consider the Tohoku earthquake from 2011. Back in 2011, Japan underwent a horrific natural disaster, when a massive underground earthquake rocked the ocean. This earthquake measured in at 9.0 on the Richter scale, making it the fourth most powerful earthquake in the world since modern record keeping began. But this underwater earthquake, well, powerful, wasn't the major threat. It was the ensuing tsunami that it created. The shifting of tectonic plates resulted in a massive amount of water displacement, triggering powerful tsunami waves that reached heights of about 40.5 meters, or 133 feet, killing an estimated 16,000 people as water surged into the cities. For perspective, this natural disaster was so big, it moved the main island of Japan 2.4 meters east. That's right, the full country moved 8 feet over because of this. And that's not all. It shifted the entire planet on its axis. Researchers estimate that the planet moved between 10 centimeters and 25 centimeters, which also affected its rotational speed by 1.8 microseconds per day. And all of this came from a tectonic shift that was about 7 miles long long, or 11 kilometers. Certainly a bit longer than the Carethan, but then again, the ground shifted vertically by about 3 feet, or 1 meter because of the earthquake. With the Carethan, there were suddenly massive holes blown in the crust of the earth, so definitely a more girthy hole, if not quite as long. The long and short of this is that Aquaman's dramatic arrival on the back of the Carethan would cause unfathomable amounts of water to collide, and the displacement would undoubtedly send waves careening towards land, on par with undersea earthquakes clocking in between 7.5 and nine and a half on the Richter scale. The actual destruction this would cause would depend on where the brine is located in the sea, which, because of this movie's insane geographic jumps, is nearly impossible to track. That said, my best guess would be somewhere in the Pacific Ocean near Japan. Why? Well, 75% of the Earth's volcanoes are located in the Pacific's Ring of Fire, and the massive Japanese spider crab, which is the largest crab on Earth, and reminiscent of the brine's crab people, live in the temperate waters near Japan. But but anyway, regardless, Aquaman sucks as the king of the sea. But don't let that obscure the fact that he also sucks as hero of the land. Sure, he quote-unquote saved the world from King Orm, but in the process, he sent destructive tsunamis out to the shores of the land and forced endangered animals to throw away their lives while he got to first base with a girl. Countless people and animals died needlessly as a result of Aquaman's actions, and this so-called hero and uniter couldn't care less. He's gonna begin his reign with a whole lot of people united, all right. United in their hatred against him. Trust me, I am no king. I agree. I agree too. But hey, that's just a theory. A film theory. And Finn. Creatures of the ocean, summon your power. Swarm that subscribe button. We may not become the ocean master, but we will become the YouTube master. We're so close to that 10 million mark.